Well, good morning. I invite you to turn your Bibles over to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 19. We're going to spend the majority of our time this morning in that Gospel. Luke chapter 19. And I trust that you all had a good night's rest. It's so good to see many of you out this morning. All of you out. There's, we have a good number this morning. And just honored and privileged to have the opportunity to be here this morning, to stand before you and break unto you the bread of life. And I hope and pray that what is presented during our Bible class period, as well as in our worship assembly, is accordance to God's will. If you have any questions or comments or anything you want to discuss about anything that is presented this morning, I invite you to come and let's talk Bible. I love talking Bible and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have or just discuss what's on your heart. I'm confident, I know the little ones are, are back in the, in the classrooms, I'm confident that I could pull any one of those little kids from their classroom this morning and ask them to tell me and tell us the story of Zacchaeus. It's a familiar story, it's a well-known story, it's a story that we learn, well, when we are we little children. And I would suggest to you that the story of Zacchaeus is not just a children's story. We often categorize that story as a children's story. But I would suggest to you it's not just a children's story. There are many lessons that we can draw from the exchange that Jesus and Zacchaeus have in that text. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down for I'm going to your house today. For I'm going to your house today. We know that song, right? The story of Zacchaeus. And it's only found in the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 19, those first 10 verses, it's only found in the, in the, in the Gospel of Luke. And there's something special about his interaction with Jesus. So let's turn there, Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. Let's read together the first 10 verses. Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. Verse 5, and when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received them joyfully. And when they saw it, they all complained, saying, he has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Lord, look, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. At this stage in Jesus' life, he's got a, a, a crowd following him. And we know where he's going, right? He's going to Jerusalem. He's going to Jerusalem to die for the sins of mankind. He's on the way to the cross. And he encounters Zacchaeus. And Mark's account, if you're taking notes, Mark chapter 10 verses 46 through 52, reveals to us it wasn't just Zacchaeus who Jesus encountered. He also encountered a man named Bartimaeus who was blind. So you have two men who Jesus encounters on his way to Jerusalem who seek after Jesus and their lives are changed forever because of their interaction with Jesus. So the question I want us to consider this morning, I want you to ask yourself this question. I ask myself this question as well, is are you seeking Jesus? Are you seeking Jesus? Are you seeking Jesus like Zacchaeus did? Let's go ahead and set this scene. Let's break down this text. Let's look at what Luke details for us. Beginning in verse two, who is Zacchaeus? Well, 
Luke describes Zacchaeus as a man who is the chief tax collector. He was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector. He was rich. This is the only place in the New Testament where we read the phrase chief tax collector. There are many occasions within the scriptures where you have the phrase tax collectors and sinners or publicans and sinners. And Jesus was accused of eating with those people, mingling with those people. But this is the only time in the scriptures we read chief tax collector. And I believe that's significant because we know how the Jews viewed tax collectors. They were viewed as traitors. They were known as greedy and they charged more than the Roman Empire demanded. They were known as corrupt. They took advantage of people. They were liars and embezzlers and, and thieves and they were dishonest. They cared more about the almighty dollar than they did about the almighty God. But not only did the Jews not like the taxes, but also the way they were collected. You're familiar with the pyramid scheme. It existed 2,000 years ago, these tax collectors. So what the chief tax collector would do, he would send out his guys to collect taxes. And he would tell them, okay, this is how much you want to collect. This is how much I'm going to take from the top of what you collect. The Jews hated tax collectors. Because they didn't know how their taxes were calculated, much like today. And they would just take and take and take. They were despised within the Jewish community. But they would have no choice but to comply. Because oftentimes they collected, the tax collectors collected more than what was really needed. So he's a chief tax collector. He sought to see who Jesus was. He sought to see who Jesus was, for he was of short stature. Some versions render that as he tried to see who Jesus was. In our English language, the definition of try is, well, to make an effort, to make an attempt to do something. I tried, and you know what, it didn't work out. In the Greek, this word, sought, it means he was trying to see who Jesus was. There was a desire to see Jesus. There was a passion to see Jesus. He was striving to see who Jesus was. And Luke goes out of his way to describe Zacchaeus' physique. He had a want-to that nothing was going to stop him from seeing Jesus, even though he was short. Now, we're not given a description of how short Zacchaeus was, but it certainly put him at a disadvantage in this situation. He can't physically see Jesus. So what does he do? Well, Luke tells us in verse 4, he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree. The sycamore tree is the largest deciduous tree in the eastern United States. It's about 75 to 100 feet tall. Its trunk is 10 feet in diameter, because of its size, it makes it very appealing for shade. They're oftentimes found in open areas or along streams. It's a big tree. So you've got a guy who is wealthy, he's powerful, he has authority, he has many possessions, he's described as someone who's rich, and he's willing to climb a tree to see Jesus. Verse 5, Jesus says, I must stay at your house. Jesus has this divine appointment with this rich chief tax collector. He wants to spend time with Zacchaeus. And he says, make haste and come down. And you notice what Zacchaeus does in verse 6. He says, so Luke, Luke records, he made haste and come down and came down. Word for word, Luke says, Zacchaeus obeyed Jesus. We cannot overlook that fact. That word for word, Zacchaeus obeyed Jesus. He did exactly what Jesus told him to do. It wasn't burdensome for Zacchaeus. He didn't argue with, with Jesus. He didn't disobey Jesus. He didn't debate with Jesus. He did exactly what 
Jesus told him to do. Verse six, and he received him joyfully. He received him joyfully. You think about a man in his position. Zacchaeus received Jesus joyfully. His job, Zacchaeus' job, his wealth, his authority, all of those things. You think he would receive ridicule for seeking after Jesus in this way. But Zacchaeus was willing to put everything aside, his pride, because of the value he saw in Jesus. Jesus, I want to know you. And Jesus, I want to spend time with you. Notice how the crowd reacts in verse 7. He's a sinner. Jesus, this man is a sinner. Again, as I mentioned, tax collectors were acknowledged in the same breath as sinners. Publicans and sinners, publicans and, and harlots, the worst of the worst sinners. And their attitude is reflected there in verse 7. They grumble, they complain. They're outraged. How can Jesus go and spend time at this chief tax collector's house? In verse 8, Zacchaeus makes the biggest decision of his life. Half of my goods to the poor. And if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. The law required various fines for different types of theft. But the amount that he set was higher than what the law of Moses required. So these are minor changes that Zacchaeus is willing to make. These are major life-changing changes that Zacchaeus is making. His wealth took a hit. But Zacchaeus was willing to do whatever it took. And brother, that's repentance. That's repentance. That's transformation. We know the definition of repentance. Repentance desires to right previous wrongs whenever possible. His heart is so changed by the invitation that, of Jesus that he is moved to act. It's putting off that old man and, and leaving all of that behind and moving forward and doing what is right. Cleansing his heart. And that new heart led to a heart of generosity. So what does Jesus do? What, how does he react? He praises Zacchaeus. Today, salvation has come to this house. You have a hated chief tax collector. Jesus says, salvation has come to this house today. What a beautiful story. What a beautiful exchange between Jesus and Zacchaeus. So what I want us to do for the remainder of our time this morning is look at three lessons that we can take away from Zacchaeus and three lessons that we can take away from Jesus. The first one I want us to look at with Zacchaeus is none of us really measure up. None of us really measure up. One thing that we know about Zacchaeus physically that he was a short man. He, physique, physically, he was physically challenged because he was short. He was a wee little man. When it comes to God's standards, we are all wee little people. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We have all fallen short of God's standard. Well, who is the standard? The standard is Jesus. We are all we little people, but the first step in salvation is that recognizing that in our own goodness, we will never measure up. What do we need? We need Jesus. Zacchaeus recognized that he didn't measure up, but he needed Jesus, that Jesus was the one who could help. None of us really measure up because we all seek something. Zacchaeus was desperately seeking something. Something was missing in his life. He was a desperate man. He was rich and he was dignified 
Yet notice what he does in verse four. Look at verse four with me again. He ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. He ran and he climbed. You know what desperate people do? Desperate people run. There's probably just a handful of people, if, if any in the room, who run for fun. Running's not fun. But if you're in a desperate situation, you've got... 10 minutes to get from one gate, the airport, to the other side of the airport, to your connecting flight. You're not going to take a leisurely stroll. You're going to run because you're desperate. You've got to catch that connecting flight. You lose a kid in the grocery store. You lose a kid in the mall. You're not just going to meander around the mall or the grocery store looking for your kid. You're going to run because you're desperately seeking your child. That's what desperate people do. Desperate people run. You know what else they do? They climb trees. Some of these kids in the room, they probably climb trees or have climbed trees. I used to climb trees. We had one in the backyard. I don't do that anymore at the age of 40. It's not a good idea. But he was willing to climb trees. That's how desperate he was to see Jesus. He sought something. He knew that Jesus was the only one who could fill that void. He had an itch in his heart that all his wealth could not scratch. You may be familiar with the publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes. I remember getting those letters in the mail when I was a kid, and I thought we hit the jackpot. Come to find out those letters, they send hundreds of thousands, even millions of those letters out. But those are computer-generated letters. And all they do is they plug in your name, they plug in your address, and they make it sound, they make it read as if you just won millions and millions of dollars. Well, years ago, a computer generated a personal letter to a church near Tampa, Florida. And the church got a letter that said this, God, we've been looking for you. You were a finalist to receive our $11 million sweepstakes. So don't just sit there, God. Return your sweepstakes form today. The Tampa Tribune interviewed the preacher. He didn't plan on returning the form because God already has at least $11 million. But that phrase, God, we've been looking for you. People... People today are looking for something. They seek happiness. They seek peace. They seek purpose in their life. But where do they look? They look for it in money. They look for it in their career. They look for it in relationships. They look for it maybe in drugs or alcohol. What they really need is God. What they need is God. Zacchaeus sought to see Jesus. There's a couple other texts there in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Seek first his kingdom. Hebrews chapter 11, and verse 6. God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And there's a common theme that we find in those texts. That seeking is not something that is passive Seeking is something where I make every effort, I strive, I fight, I press on, I work out my salvation. Because there are no scriptures in the Bible that tell us I can coast in heaven. I can coast to eternal life. Eternal life is given to those who seek. Third and final point with Zacchaeus is that we can overcome limitations. We can overcome limitations. Jesus was so significant to Zacchaeus that Zacchaeus was not conquered by his limitations. By his height, by his job, his wealth, his influence, his authority, he conquered them. And in fact, I would suggest he used them in quite a remarkable way. Just think about your job for a moment. You're not excelling at your job. You're constantly complaining to your supervisor or to your manager about your limitations. I can't do this because of that. I can't do that because of this. 
do you think is going to happen? You're going to be looking for another job. I told some of you already, I worked in the media industry for 13 and a half years. What if I went to my editor and said, I need a faster iPhone to take my photos, my video, record my interviews. I need a better computer. I had this one for five years. Can you get me a better computer? I would like 56 cents mile reimbursement instead of 26 cents in mileage reimbursement. I complained and complained and complained. You're looking for another reporter, You're looking for another journalist. We are, we are in situations where we can make plenty of excuses. We all have personal limitations, but do we allow those limitations to define who we are? When we fail to overcome our limitations and rather use them as an excuse, we are saying that God hasn't given me the power to overcome those limitations. We're calling God unfaithful. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Fear is used in a number of ways within the scriptures. Fear is used in a way of, of respect and reverence toward God. I fear God. I fear what he can do. I respect that. I respect that so much. I submit to him. Well, fear in this case, in which Paul uses with Timothy, is that cowardice fear. God has not given us the fear, that type of fear, to be a coward, to be timid in what I do. Because if I have that type of fear, I can box myself in. God, God knows our limitations. None of us here is perfect. The perfect specimen perfect in height, weight, skin tone, definition. We all have our limitations. God knows what those limitations are because he's given us those limitations. But he's confident in our ability to overcome those limitations because Zacchaeus did, and we can as well. All right, let's shift gears a little bit. Let's look at Jesus. Let's look at Jesus. Let's look at Jesus. Three points about Jesus. Let's look at verse 10. Let's read verse 10 again. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That was his mission. Well, oftentimes we isolate that verse and we can quote Luke chapter 19, verse 10, but we forget the context in which it is written. Because what we know about Jesus is that he knows you. He knows who you are. Don't you like it when someone calls you by your name, your first name? You know what that shows? That shows that there is a personal interest in you. There's intimacy in that relationship. There's affection. There's a connection between those two people. What's the first word that Jesus says to Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus. He calls him by his name. And we appreciate that in our relationships. Instead of, hey, hey, you. There's, there's, there's a disconnect there. You know, I say Wesley. Or I say Carrie or Gary. That means I have a personal interest in you. There's a connection, that a bond that we already have. That's what Jesus demonstrates here in this text. He calls him by his first name. He, that's the very first word that he says. You can imagine Zacchaeus as the chief tax collector. He was probably called a lot of names that we can't mention up here from the pulpit. He was hated, I'm sure. But Jesus knew his name. And I would suggest that Jesus knows everybody's name. Look at Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 1. Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 1. What's beautiful about our relationship with God is that you and I, we don't have to wear a name tag for God. God knows who we are. He knows our name. Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 1. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are 
mine. But it isn't just the name, our name and your name that Jesus knows about you. He knows everything about you. Look at Luke chapter 12. Jump back a few chapters in the gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. Look at verse 6. Luke chapter 12 in verse 6. Are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins, and not one of them is forgotten about God? The sparrow was the cheapest thing in the market. Their value was low. But Jesus says they are not forgotten by God. We, as God's crowning jewel of his creation, are much more valuable than those sparrows. How intimate does our God know us? Look at verse 7. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you of our more value than many sparrows. He even knows a number of hairs on your head. As much as I love my wife, Nicole, as much as I love Alexis and Autumn, my girls, I have never taken the time to sit down and count the number of hairs on their head. <laughs> now, they'd always joke with me, Daddy. It's really easy to count the number of hairs on your head. You don't have any hair. But think about how much our God knows about us. He knows everything about us. He knows every day how much hair you lose, how much hair grows back. He knows the struggles that you have with your health. He knows the financial strain that you are in. He knows about your relationships. He knows about your personality. He knows what motivates you. He knows what your strengths are. He knows what your weaknesses are. He knows everything about you. He knows how poorly your boss may be treating you at work. He knows all the hurts that are in the deep recesses of your heart. And your heavenly father wants you to know that as long as something concerns you, it concerns him. It concerns him as well. We may think that we're all alone in this world. Nobody knows who I am. Nobody really cares. But there's a loving God who created this entire universe. There's a loving God who created you who does care. First Peter chapter 5 and verse 7, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. You can take that to the bank, brother. Your God cares about you. He cares about you so much that he knows what you need. And what do you need? You need a relationship with Jesus. Look again with me in verse 5. Go back to our original text. Luke chapter 19 of verse 5 says this. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down for today. I must stay at your house. He beckons Zacchaeus to come down from that tree. If you're familiar with that song, Zacchaeus, a wee little man, and all the hand motions that go along with it. What do we teach our children in the Bible classes? Zacchaeus, you come down for I'm going to your house today. You know, he's pointing the finger at him. He's doing it sternly. Zacchaeus, you come down. But I would suggest to you with what we know about Jesus and how compassionate he was with people. Now, he's not saying that to Zacchaeus sternly, pointing his finger at him. He's doing so with a loving heart, a compassionate heart. Jesus spoke those words in love and tenderness. And I'm certain many of the citizens of Jericho expected Jesus to deliver a strong rebuke to that little chief tax collector. They're thinking to themselves, Zacchaeus, he's finally going to get what he deserves. What did we read there in verse 10? Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn sinners. He came into the world to save us. And instead of condemning Zacchaeus, he looks at Zacchaeus and says, come on, let's go to your house. Let's go to your house. Jesus wanted to be friends with Zacchaeus. Turn your Bible to John chapter 15, the gospel of John. John chapter 15. John chapter 15, verses 13 through 17. John chapter 15, verses 13 through 17. 13 through 15, I'm sorry. John 15, 13 through 15. 
Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends for all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. There's much that goes on before what we just read and after. Jesus wants to be our friend because we don't have the power to make the changes that we need to make. We don't have that power ourselves. Jesus is the one who can help us make those changes. With Jesus as our friend, he can help us clean up our act. And thirdly, he sees you not as you are, but as you, you who you can become. He sees you not as you are, but as who you can become. Everyone looked at Zacchaeus. What did they see? They saw a sinner. They saw the ch chief tax collector. That's who they saw. Do you know what the name Zacchaeus means? It means cleansing. It means salvation. It means pure, innocent. Because you notice what Jesus says to him in verse 9. He says, today salvation has come to this house. Salvation is a cleansing. Salvation is when we are made pure. And that is what Zacchaeus' name means. Everybody looked at Zacchaeus as a sinner. Jesus saw a man who could be cleansed. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. We read that salvation is only through Jesus. Peter there is addressing the Sanhedrin. Nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus didn't see a crooked chief tax collector. He saw a man who could become pure. He saw a man who could become so generous, he would give half his money away. Could have very e Jesus very easily could have said, Zacchaeus, you're a thief. You repent. And you pay back what you owe to all these people. And you do so with interest. And you do so with penalties. Then I will come to your house. And then I will eat with you. That wasn't the mindset of Jesus. Come, let us get to know each other. You get to know who I am. You get to know who I am and what I'm all about. You'll see yourself in a different light. You want to make some changes. Jesus says the same today to us. You've made mistakes in your life. You've got sin in your life. Jesus is here today. And he's lovingly lovingly, compassionately pointing the finger at you saying, come on, let's be friends. Let's be friends. After Zacchaeus got to know who Jesus is, he demonstrated that he was a changed man. He paid everyone back four times what he had stolen. He gave half his money to the poor. He was transformed. It's easy for us to say, well, I'm a Christian and I'm a member of this local congregation. I've been baptized. I've been changed. But you know where that proof is at? That proof is in how you live. Have you changed the way that you live? My wife and I, we were listening to a podcast together and had this quote. Information and inspiration without application leads to a lack of transformation. And went on to say, we can amen, we can come to Bible study, but if we do not apply the scriptures, we will not be transformed. I think Christians, I, I grew up in a Christian home, been very, very blessed from day one. I fear too many Christians have the check the box mentality. Well, I went to Bible study, check that box, went to worship service, check that box. I, I contributed, I took the Lord's Supper, I did all those things. Okay, I'm good to go. Brother, that's not the mentality we ought to have. It's all about transformation. Have you changed in the way you think? Have you changed in the way you talk? Have you changed in the way you live your life? 
So start seeing yourself as God sees you. Jesus has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Verse 10 of Luke 19. When God looks at you today, he sees in you what you can become. He sees in you the great potential that you can be as a child of God. Let's close this morning. There are two kinds of people in this world. There are people in one type of that, one, one category of people, someone like Zacchaeus, and someone like Tom Brady. Probably heard who Tom Brady is, right? He's won a lot of Super Bowls, seven Super Bowls. He did an interview. He was 27 years old at the time. He did an interview when he was 27 years old. At that point in his life, he had won three Super Bowls, had a huge contract with the New England Patriots. And he told 60 Minutes this quote. Why do I have three Super Bowl rings and still feel like there is something greater out there for me? I mean, maybe a lot of people would say, hey, man, this is what it is. I've reached my goal, my dream, my life is me, I think. It's got to be more than this. This is a man who his net worth is 250 million. His wife's net worth is 400 million. He's got seven Super Bowls, probably will win at least one, two, maybe three more before he retires. He's got it all. We with the world thinks he's got it all. Later in his life, in 2015, he did another interview with the New York Times. And they asked him about that 60 minutes interview. And he said, after that interview, I got a litany of Bibles sent to me. He was searching for something. More than likely, he's still searching for something. There's still that void in his life. We can find money. We can find a job, career, relationship. But we really can't scratch that itch in our heart unless Jesus is in our heart. He's calling you by name. He's saying, I want to have a relationship with you. If you're here this morning, you don't have a relationship with Jesus. But I would presume that most of us in the room this morning are former Zacchaeuses. We have a relationship with Jesus. We may think, well, that is a really nice children's story. And I hope that our eyes have been opened this morning and recognized that it's much more than a children's story. That we can look at the story of Zacchaeus and, and learn from it. It's about seeking and saving those lost people. And there are lost people all around us, everywhere we turn. I want you to consider this question for you who are former Zacchaeuses. Are you willing to be a tree to lift people above the crowd so that they can see Jesus? Are you willing to be a tree to lift people above the crowd so they can see Jesus? I would encourage us this morning to think about the role of that sycamore tree. And that we're like that sycamore tree. Can you be the person to lift people up above the crowd so that they can see who Jesus really is? They can see Jesus very clearly. We know that we can't save people. Jesus is the only one who can save people. We can't change people. Jesus is instrumental in changing people. But our job is to lift people up until they see Jesus. And we turn it over to Jesus. I think about that story in Luke 19. God planted that tree just in the right spot so that he could see Jesus. God has planted you somewhere. God has planted you somewhere. It could be your job community, your school. God has planted you somewhere in your life. You have a purpose in your life. He's planted you there to simply lift people up above the crowd so that they can see Jesus. Because Jesus states in verse 10, it's all about people. It's always been about people. It will always be about people. Zacchaeus, he woke up that morning thought to himself, well, how much money can I swindle from these people? He went to bed that night 
thinking how much money, how much more money could I give away? That's transformation, folks. That's transformation. And whenever Jesus had an encounter with someone, he always expected change from that person. He always expected change. Jesus, in any situation that he was in, he made that situation better. Reminded, if you're taking notes, this one just, just came to my mind. Luke, or excuse me, Mark chapter 2. He's eating with tax collectors and sinners. And Mark gives us a very, deta- very uh, close, de- descriptive detail there in verse 15. He says, they followed him. Jesus, in any situation that he was in, expected the people who he encountered to be better, to change. And that's what Zacchaeus did. He changed. So as we wind down this morning, I appreciate so much your kind attention. Have you changed? Zacchaeus changed. Have you been transformed in your life as a Christian? Thank you so much for your attention this morning.